from across the globe. From the center of aerospace. And now to you. Thank you for downloading the Aero Society podcast from the Royal Aeronautical Society. I hope this isn't going to be too much of a sales campaign for the flight simulation group. But uh, I say this because on council the other day, it seemed to be that people weren't aware of what the, sim the flight simulation group has done, but it's emphasized several times here. Um, I'll give you that my history very quickly. As I say, started with BOACBA, and in short, then ended up seven years with flying for uh, Airbus training in Toulouse, instructing on the A320, 330, 340, but also working as a technical pilot on the simulator, liaising with flight tests. So uh, seven very enjoyable years with, um, with uh, Airbus in Toulouse. And like many people, you can see the airplane that I flew. I started with a flying scholarship with the Air, Air Training Corps, the CCF, on a Tiger Moth, then on Piston Province very briefly with the uh, Royal Navy as the last National Service course to fly. Went flew with the Air Crawl for a while and then joined BOAC. You can see the various airplanes. I flew there, 707, 747, TriStar, and then uh, with the Sheikhs in Abu Dhabi. And I finally flew the Airbus with Air Mauritius and then joined uh, uh, Airbus in Toulouse. You can see I did fly an Oster. Um, our leader actually picked some unmown barley instead of the, the normal landing runway, ended upside down, but we're happy to say it's still flying again. I did do a bit of motor racing, a little bit of that, if, if people want to talk to me after that. Also probably shows I was interested in psychomotor reaction, shall we say, tied up with uh, flying. Um, what we're going to talk about here is the history of aviation to begin with, to refresh you the need for training right from the early days, how simulators developed, how simulators are essential now for training, of course, and how they are a vital part of airline finance, helping to the low fares, and then going on to the engineering simulators, mainly in Toulouse, of course, and how they're a fundamental part of the aircraft development, and space tourism, a little bit about that, and then to confirm if you think they're going to be pilots in the future, and the need for training, if we will still need simulators for training if we don't have any pilots. So starting again in the history of aviation, as you well know, Leonardo da Vinci had some very foresighted thoughts. Uh, Otto Lilienthal was one of the first persons to fly, uh, as you can see there, in the mid-1850s-ish onwards, and also, our man, of course, the, was Cayley, who started, as you can see there, he started in 1773 to 1857, and he worked out in his home, he had a sort of a rotating, um, you might say, wind tunnel, um, and he worked out the control forces necessary, which uh, are necessary for... for lift and, and weight and thrust and drag and he then produced you probably know this glider which was launched off the side of a hill and as part of the centenary celebrations a replica was launched off the side of a hill and you can see our splendid uh, Richard Branson had a go himself uh, it's interesting, the French don't seem to acknowledge him. The, the French have a museum, very good museum in Toulouse, but the first person they mention for flying is in 1790. They don't actually mention uh, George Cayley. But uh, then, of course, we had the Wright brothers. And what we're really saying here is that it took them some time to train themselves to fly. They did a lot of work on kites and handheld uh, aircraft. Then, of course, they had their first flight, as you know, which was the first control-powered flight. Um, 
And interestingly enough, later in the afternoon, unfortunately, they crashed. But part of the centenary celebration, to remember that, people tried to, or they did, they produced replicas, but they weren't terribly successful. There was one in Australia which flew well, but again, it shows how much need there is for, for flight training. Where was the flight, first flight simulator? Well, it definitely goes to the French. In 1909, that was the Antoinette flight trainer, which was two upturned barrels. And that's a picture which I now realize was uh, actually, I'm sure it's Hubert Latham, who was a, a French aviator of some note. And he nearly beat Blériot across the channel. Unfortunately, he ditched. Otherwise, he would have been the first to cross, I think I had the right. So he was the first to land an aircraft on water. Quite topical now when you look at the film of the Hudson is coming around. But he was a remarkable aviator. Now, you see those wheels. I, um, we can have a look at them later on in this simulator here. Uh, as I say, the whole simulator was just learning to fly the aircraft only in good weather and daylight. They were very unstable, these initial airplanes. And as I'm sure you know, they used to recruit pilots who were good horsemen because they felt that riding a horse was similar to flying the airplanes at the time. That's the actual simulator, which was a replica, was in Airbus training in Toulouse. It's now in the uh, Aeroscopia Museum. Uh, and you can see the two wheels. Well, one was for up and down, the other one for, for left and right which I think would be quite difficult to fly. No wonder they found had difficulty. Now, what, uh, that was training pilots to fly in good weather and daylight, of course. And of course, in due course, people were having to fly in cloud and at night. Now, if, I don't know if, how good you are at aircraft recognition. I don't know what you know, that type of aircraft. But I'll tell you for nothing, it was a Douglas aircraft, which was used in the mail services of the United States. Now, this was in the 1930s. There was a big scandal of the companies carrying the air mail, so it was given to the Army Air Corps, and they started flying the mail, but it was a disaster, and they were, had numerous crashes and 12 fatalities, and something had to be done because pilots were unable to fly in cloud and therefore they were having all these accidents. Maybe because I come from a nautical background, it r reminds me of the Longitude Prize. Do you remember that? In 1707, the seven or four ships of the British fleet went aground just off the Scilly Isles because they didn't know where they were, what their longitude was. They were further east than they thought they were, and that led to the Longitude Prize being um, proposed or offered in, in 1714 and there's a picture of the ships at the time and the Longitude Prize, if you remember that, was won by John Harrison who actually brought out a clock that so the, the navigators could actually know where they were in longitude as well as in latitude. So what was the solution to the US Army's problems? It was Ed Link. Ed Link came along, and in 1928, he'd learned to fly. His father had an organ building business, and so Ed worked on his pilot trainer. And he conceived this device which allowed pilots to do their training while they were on the ground. With his organ building experience, he put some motion into it, which was quite uh, significantly useful. All you really need is a little kick to show you uh, where you're going, in fact, from a motion point of view. And this blue box was the first effective trainer which really made Ed Link the father of flight simulation. And he was awarded the RAS Wakefield Gold Medal in 1947 by Prince Philip. Interestingly enough, his early customers, which we come to in the amusement park later on, were not... Um, the training establishments, but they were in amusement parks. And they were there as amusement rides. But in 1934, of course, the US Army Corps picked it up and they ordered the blue box. And 10,000 were built during the war period. 
and over a half a million pilots were trained and it really transformed the safety of flying in cloud. And just to emphasize the value of having simulators, in 1945, a training airplane cost 10 pounds an hour, $10 an hour, sorry. I remember I was paying three pounds an hour for an Oster and Tiger in those days. And the link trainer cost four cents an hour. So you can see that it was one 250th of the cost of an airplane, quite apart from the safety aspects. Now here's old Ed Link's blue box. As I say, the blue box, to emphasize that, allowed pilots to fly on instruments, uh, probably in quite stable clouds. To emphasize now, of course, the latest flight simulators with motion and everything uh, allow crews to be trained in all acceptable weather conditions, including wind shear and things like that. There's the blue box. You can see that the instructor was outside the, the blue box itself, so it was only useful for a single pilot learning to fly on instruments not used for now for multi-crews, which is essential in, in the current environment. So see if this one actually will go backwards. This was, um, I've got to try and... Then through a new marvel of science, this was said to be fairly recently, and I thought it was quite interesting. of all the pilot's tasks, to fly by instruments alone. In the blind link trainer, listening in his phones to the instructor's directions, he acquires the personal skill that will one day enable him to fly 600 miles over a darkened Europe to Germany. We will now do a spin. Close the throttle. Move the control column fully back. What I find interesting, he's right. actually putting him into a spin, which I don't think is terribly realistic, but that's one of the reasons I thought it was interesting to see. But you can see it. Simulating a spin. I assume this be a Canadian because he's sort of in RAF uniform, but you can get a feel for the instruments. And now you will see. In the same way, his instructor teaches him to use the Lorentz beam, which will guide him to a safe landing in England when fog and blackout have hidden his home field. The interrupted note tells him that he is well, coming into the path of the beam. People have forgotten all about this. But this is an SBA approach. Turns. Where you listen and to the dot dash or that dot. Landing. And it would bring you in on a beam. And as you can see, they talk about landing to a blind landing. Well, they're probably not too unrealistic, because of course you're landing on a grass it field. You haven't got to put it on a runway. So it is to the overconfident. So, um, he ends up with a little bit here, which I think is unfortunate. He forgets that he is losing height too fast. I think we would say that was a bit of negative training, probably. We try to avoid that sort of thing nowadays. Dies horrible death. So we'll go on. Now, this is from a film, The Pilots. You may not have seen it. Uh, it shows a, one of the students at Hamble in the early days of the BOAC BEA training school. But it shows them putting in an aircraft into a spin on the real aeroplane. I think that's a slightly more realistic training exercise than doing it in a link, link trainer. That, uh, of course, is, is on the web now if you want to see it. It, it describes a pilot going on, through his training onto the VC-10. But uh, I would emphasize, I don't think a link trainer is capable of replicating all this, this sensation of, of spinning and abnormal attitudes. And especially now there have been some upset uh, accidents. The policy now is that all pilots should spin an aircraft. I don't know if it's current. Um, it, it isn't a requirement anymore but I think the better schools actually put it in their, um, in their syllabus that on the light aircraft, when they start their training, they should include spinning. As I say, it was taken out of the syllabus in some regulations, and if possible, they should go on to practice aerobatics. Trouble is, of course, people will look at the cost of it and try and reduce the cost as much as possible. 
But anyhow, actually the point I was making there is the link uh, blue box is just a generic trainer and it didn't simulate any specific, specific aircraft type. Then the next stage of development of flight simulators was obviously to build uh, simulators for specific aircraft types. There's one for the B-25 bomber and there's one for the Stratocruiser, slightly personal. I did my first acceptance into BOAC on a Stratocruiser just down the road, which not that I understood what was going on, but they seemed to know I, I did sufficiently well to get in. Then, of course, that's the simulator we have nowadays, of course, with full motion and visual systems. And then there are many other types of part-type trainers which we'll discuss. But the point was, as those simulators developed in the 70s and 80s, they were produced by the individual manufacturers who went to the airline and said, there you are, here's this nice simulator, what do you think about it? There were no actual standards, and it was the Royal Aeronautical Flight Simulation Group that got together and created a standard for top-level flight simulators, and this was eventually adopted by ICAO. So, what are the essential parts of a flight simulator? One thing everybody will like, of course, is computing systems, which make the whole thing work. You need an aircraft flight deck, of course, with sound. You need an aircraft uh, instructor operating station to set the thing up and also feed in uh, defects. You need a visual system, of course. That is in two sections. There's the image generator and the display system. And then you have a motion system, which is necessary for, I would say, certainly for airline training. Very um, contentious subject. Some people say we don't need motion systems. But for airlines, I know that they insist that motion systems are working for their check syllabus. And then, of course, the important thing is you do need a sensible course program, competent instructors, and certification of the simulator and maintenance. And just to emphasize, you cannot have a simulator or a instruction without a properly qualified instructor who must have held a professional pilot's license. He must have done a type rating, and he must have a current instructor rating, and if necessary, an examiner's rating. Uh, I'll just make the, yes, the EASA rules have changed, made it slightly more difficult to renew, which may or may not be worthwhile. The computing systems, initially, of course, aircraft were all mechanical, as were the simulators, and they had valves, and took some considerable time to set up, and then they would go off. So they really needed an expert to set them up. And there was a radiator operator outside the simulator doing that. The computing capacity was not really capable of replicating the airplane properly. And it was the whole handling of the airplane really depended on the judgment of the individual pilot who was assessing the flight simulator. And quite often, the engineers could fly this simulator better than the, the, the pilots themselves. And to show I'm putting a French input here, talking to the Caravelle people, the test pilot of, of of uh, Sud Aviation couldn't land the simulator, but the engineer could do it very well. The result was, of course, that the crews could sort of find tricks to fly the simulator. So at that stage, we're talking about the 60s, uh, we had to do every other check on the airplane. So when I was on the 707, we would do a, a one check in the simulator, which would be pretty basic. But then we'd go to Stansted or wherever and fly the airplane and do the asymmetric training, it'd be an engine out training on the airplane. But then, of course, digital computing came along. People will be glad to know. And you can memorize that now as the uh, systems of, of a simulator where things are fed into the flight model and out to the visual system, sound system, motion system, into displays, the navigation systems. So what do the computing systems have to do? Obviously, it must replicate the aircraft handling, the visual and motion systems. It was obviously replicate all kinds of weather on the ground and in the atmosphere and their effects. Again, you must have all the ground terrain built in there, plus the radio aids. 
an increasing number of aircraft navigation and other systems which come along. Additionally, of course, aircraft didn't have flight management systems. They had to be included. GPS came along and GPWS, which is the ground particularly warning system. Wind shear became uh, necessary and uh, after a, particularly one accident of Delta in uh, Dallas and had up displays, there's a TCAS, the traffic control avoidance system where you have two aircraft approaching each other and you get a warning in the cockpit so they can then be told which way to go to avoid them. And now of course we're having electronic displays, electronic checklists, the flight bag, no longer any, any charts. All that has to be added to the simulator. And even now, of course, we've got video cameras uh, giving outside views of the cockpit. Then, of course, having got that all set up, the aircraft must be capable of repositioning anywhere in the world. And not only the airplane's got to be in the right place, but the flight management system. When in the early days, you'd find you'd move the aircraft, but the flight management system didn't took a bit of time to catch up. And the other thing, of course, is that we feed in a lot of failures, fires, engine failures, instrument failures. Those have got to be uh, replicated properly and exactly. And then, of course, once you finish with the thing, you've got to clear it and put everything back to normal. So the computations necessary in flight simulators are very uh, complex indeed. So what do we need to the aircraft flight deck? Therefore, in fact, that happens to be the first 747 digital simulator we had in the 1960s. And you shouldn't be able to tell whether you're on an airplane or a simulator. That's a picture of an A330 uh, flight deck. And I honestly couldn't tell you if it's the airplane or a simulator. But having said that, the feel of all the flight controls must be identical. What's, even things like the radio selection switches Immediately, if it doesn't feel right, then the realism goes and the training value goes. The instructor operating station, we said this before, the link one, of course, was outside the cockpit. Um, initially, as I said, we said that the analog system was set up by a radio aids instructor outside. That could be an advantage because it left the instructor inside free to just concentrate on the instruction. And also, some of these uh, radio age people were ex-crew uh, members and really could do an excellent job in simulating air traffic control. If you remember Peter Ustinov, I mean, he could mimic anything. And similarly, there was Tony Angel, who was an ex-naval uh, Sparks, as they call it, electronics engineer, and he'd flown as a radio operator throughout all over the world, and he could mimic any of the uh, air traffic controllers worldwide. The idea now is to have synthetic air traffic control it's taking a long time to get up to the standard with your old Tony Angel. So getting on with the instructor operating stations, um, as I say, he's got to set up the airfield weather, set up the aircraft itself, reposition the aircraft on the ground in the air, fail systems at appropriate times, and restore them. This is all done through the instructor operating station. But to emphasize, making these selections are secondary to the instructor's main task. His main task, of course, is to monitor the crew and to, in the early days, of course, help them to instruct them and diagnose their problems if there are any. And the important thing is to recognize the difference between minor slips and incurable incompetence to say, well, really, this person is never going to make the standard. And if it's a check ride, of course, he's got to sign their license off and, if, if necessary, not revalidate the license because the final outcome, of course, is the safety of everybody involved. So that's the instructor's prime job. A little instruction, a little uh, about the, the problems of um, instructor stations. I give this example um, 
from a very good friend, I don't know if anybody knew, Ed Strongman, who was sadly recently died. He was, ended up as the chief test pilot military of Airbus. He did the first flight on the A400M. Very, uh, he was a test pilot, of course, a very unusual test pilot. He actually took the trouble to become a, an instructor. And I remember dear old Ed was highly embarrassed. He was having to learn the simulator, of course, and he said he thought he'd done everything right. He got the engine started, and the crew, of course, were waiting for pushback clearance, and he couldn't find where to push the thing back. And in fact, you go through these various selections, and in fact, where was it to push it back? In fact, you select services on this particular simulator, and if you press services, then it tells you where to push back. But if you're moving from one simulator to another, it's quite difficult. And again, getting back to the realism and the faith the crew have in the instructor, you've only got to have one or two minor little slit-ups and the crew lose confidence in what goes on and the training realism is lost. There's a particular incident I had where it could be that the, air crew, air, the crew came in too high. So you say, you freeze it at this position and say, well, we've arrived too high and have a, want to have a discussion on why. And so I looked at the initial freeze panel and it said, hold position. So I thought, well, that's all right. So I pressed the hold button and it immediately put, me on, put us on the ground at the aircraft holding position on the runway. What I should have done is to press the position freeze button. Now, you could say that was my mistake, of course, which it was, but it's the problem of one of my hobby horses were getting some standardization of the instructor's stations because you have all this realism built into the system and just by some little uh, errors there can destroy the whole realism. These are the, how the operating stations have developed. Um, we had one in Toulouse where we developed and were convinced by uh, an ergonomist of New Zealand uh, that we should have the screens one above the other, which I agreed with. And I'm happy to see now that the latest simulators have these screens one above the other. So you're looking ahead to the crews. And you don't have to distract, move your head. The, if you had previously, you had screens on the side. And as soon as you, you're distracted, by having to set up the simulator, you lose what's going on. And this is just what we need in the current simulators. That's a 787. And with a head-up display, of course, the instructor's got to be able to see what the crews are doing, and he can't see it through the head-up display. So you've got to have that selectable on the instructor station. Because especially if you're in upset recovery, the head-up indications will change to assist the recovery. So it's essential, of course, that the instructor can see what's being given to the crews. That's an A350 flight deck. You can see that the screens are slightly different to what they were in the link days. And again, you could select the various um, the screens which are given to the pilot on the instructor station. Some people were saying, well, we must have screens all over the place, but I think you will see there that in the instructor station, you've got so many screens that he can't actually move up to between the pilots. Uh, Ed Cook, who is the FAA head of simulation, said that if you're instructing a crew to begin with, you really need to be between them to watch where their eyes are looking. This is in the early instructional days. You've really got to, to help the crews. You've got to be able to see exactly where they're looking uh, to see why they're making certain decisions and flying in a certain way. Obviously, once the crew are trained, the instructor should take a back seat and he'll be at the back just playing air traffic controller and not involving himself in the crew operation at all. So... A rather odd thing, perhaps you might say, was the NASA 737 Flying Laboratory in Langley in the 1980s. This is when 
electronic screens were coming in. And NASA thought that was sufficiently uh, worthwhile to actually uh, have a 737 with an electronic cockpit in the back and a real cockpit at the front. I mention this because I think it was the Solent side was saying, did I have any feelings on how electronic instruments were evolved? Well, you might say part of that was through the 737 at Langley. There was also advanced flight deck at the Weybridge, uh, organized by British Aerospace. So now we come to the visual system. Initially, they were just by TV cam cameras over models. And I was reminded the other day that the engineers could upset the pilots by putting flies on the runway or something, so you'd be very confused as you came into land. They didn't last too long, of course. As computers came along, we got computer graphics, which were a bit basic to begin with, but rapidly developed. Um, so really, you can't tell the difference between reality uh, or a photograph and the generated image, as we know that there's so, so much uh, movement or now through games and films and simulation. They're all coming together uh, to help in the technology. That's one again, Sydney Harbour. That's a simulated, uh, generated image, but again, you couldn't really say, is that a photograph or isn't it? How do they work? Well, the important thing is you've got two pilots in two seats. They've got to be able to look out the front and get the same image. So this is done by having a projector above that shines forward onto a screen, a, on a, through a screen onto a mirror, and you can see that's the pilot's eye position. They, both pilots, then, will then get the correct uh, collimated visual system. So that's the theory, and that's why you have this very big uh, semicircular outside to the simulator. You say, well, how do they have a nice big mirror? Well, in fact, it's just done on a flexible mylar sheet. And it's uh, put in place by suction. And therefore, you get a beautiful effect of a mirror, which, in fact, is a mylar sheet. The motion systems, well, we showed you the early motion system, which was the Antoinette, very unstable. And it was done by two upturned barrels. Then the Link Trainer, which had a little bit of emotion in it, thanks to Ed Link and his working in the organ works to begin with. And that's one that I've, is, is on the web somewhere, which is one of the early um, one on gimbals. And I think you can see these in uh, some uh, arcades nowadays, if you want to have a nice uh, upset. Nowadays, on the, the civil simulators, you have this uh, six-axis motion platform, which can be run hydraulically or actioned by hydraulically or, or nowadays electrically, and is driven again by a computer, of course. How does it work? As you know, that uh, angular motions are felt in, in your similar circuit clouds in your ears. And in fact, you actually feel the motion before you will notice it through your eyes. I'm told that's because our eyes came along after our motion systems. The important thing is, of course, is that you have to have them very, the motion system and the visual system matched very closely together. Otherwise, it's most upsetting and the crew will feel sick. Um, but anyhow, the motions are calculated by the uh, equations of motions, which all our mathematicians would love. So if you like mathematics, this is just the industry to go into, if you can memorize that. And again, how does this work? Because obviously, if you're going to simulate the aircraft fully, you're going to have a massive uh, platform like the size of a hangar. So what, in fact, this motion system does, if you're going to rotate, gives you a little kick and that's all you need to begin with, because your senses will not feel, there's a little more acceleration if you feel. You get the initial acceleration, 
And then what it does is to wash out, you can see that, very slowly, so you don't notice that. Obviously, you only notice uh, motions of a certain, above a certain value. So it will give you the initial kick, and then it'll wash it out back to where it was before, uh, ready for the next particular motion. So some people will say, well, of course, motion systems are a fiddle. Well, yes, they are, but they're good enough for most civil flying. If you really need high G, which we'll come to, you need to be on a centrifuge where you go round in circles. But that's not necessary in civil flying. To show you how the, the motion is sensed from your basic mass, you can see you could only get a fairly small amount of acceleration sensed from the simulator. As I say, it's not really necessary to have anything more, more violent than that. Because most of the time, in civil flying, you're, you don't have a continuous G. However, the only time we see continuous G probably is in training, where we put, ask the crews to go into 66 degrees of bank. Uh, this is normally done on normal, on the transition training, in fact, on the Airbus to demonstrate that it has a limit of 66 degrees. But if you can see from there that at 66, 60 degrees of bank, you're actually pulling 2G, because of course, as you're rolling over, you need to keep the, the, the airplane uh, vertical flying. You need to have a higher acceleration as you pull the G. And it, so on the simulator, you will go into your bank, but you will not feel anything. You'll get an initial kick. And in fact, on the Airbus, it has an ECAM. This is a picture of a, an A330 uh, display of, of the flight instruments. And if you pull more than 1.4 G, a little uh, pop-up comes to see what actual pull, G you're pulling, and you'll never pull more than 2 G. But what do the crew feel if they're on the simulator? They just feel as if they're in an armchair. So the important thing is to realize the limitation of the simulator in its acceleration. The motion is good enough, but it, it isn't realistic for high G maneuvers. And this sort of it comes up if you do a, a full pull-up for a uh, GPWS, you know, ground proximity warning system. If you're flying towards a hill, then you will get a pull-up, pull-up, and you all on an Airbus, a protected airplane, you just have to pull back on the stick and it will climb away just above the storm. This particular uh, diagram was produced in the 1970s, or correct no further on than now, correction, 1990s at Airbus when I was there. And it shows that if you have a non protected airplane like the 747, then you you, you have to pull back and judge the acceleration. You mustn't get back to the stall, whereas, I say, on the protected airplanes, you just have to pull right back. And for that reason, of course, you climb away much quicker. Now, the standard sales pitch for Airbus is to put a new pilot in the simulator and say, there you are, on this airplane, all you have to pull back, and you can climb away without thinking, and it'll climb away at the maximum angle. And then they would go on the airplane and say, there you are, now do your maximum pull-up. Nearly all the pilots would pull back, but as soon as they felt some G, they would back off, because they hadn't felt it in the simulator. And my particular hobby horses, in a way, there are a number of accidents we've had where people have got into high G situations, and they've suddenly... Uh, made some drastic error and flown to the ground. And I wonder myself, it's because they suddenly experienced G, which they haven't had on the simulator, and it's an abnormal experience in the airplane, and that's what's caused them to be confused. Again, we've heard uh, people say that the aircraft's not correct because it's not like the simulator. 
And in a way, sometimes that may or may not be true because the simulator should be exact, but quite often, and I um, can quote some, uh, some places where crews have got completely confused where the airplane was definitely correct and uh, uh, the simulator was not, could not replicate that particular event the same. So, what about other motion systems? You can have seats which vibrate, you can pull your straps in, and that is sufficiently satisfactory for certain um, types of training. As I say, it also saves the expense of having a full motion system, which can be very expensive. Again, getting back to if you really want to have a high G where you're um, accelerating uh, like a, in a fighter aircraft, you've got to put yourself into a, into a high G uh, simulator, which a centrifuge, which you can see there, there are several examples. Now, the other thing you could say... <laughs> I mean, some simulators, high motion simulators do exist. In games, arcades, I don't know if you've ever seen these. But we haven't quite got to, to using those in uh, civil simulators yet. But, uh, so there may be a possibility of having slightly more advanced motion systems but I don't think it's likely to happen in the civil world. Now the other thing is coming back to the expense of the full flight simulators. The full flight simulator, which are necessary for crews to fly to avoid aircraft training, are very expensive. Initially, when I started my training with Airbus, uh, we actually were learning to to program the flight management system on the simulator, which was a great waste of simulator time because it would take you 40 minutes. So now uh, there are many part type training devices used to prepare the crews to learn to program the flight uh, management system and stuff like that. Now, this of course is the type of things which were necessary. The flight management systems came in and that could be trained in a part task trainer. On the other hand, when you get wind shear, that requires motion and full flight simulator to carry out wind shear training. That must be trained in a full flight simulator. And coming back to the part task trainers, these can be in many forms. You can just get a simple PC, basically, or you can get other devices which are uh, built just as part task trainers. The important thing is that the, the, the software must be absolutely identical. Otherwise, you do get negative training. If you use a part task trainer and the, 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 the inputs are not the correct and the reactions are not correct, then, as I say, the crews will get confused when they get on the real thing. So this is what uh, Airbus will come to all the, the software is used for the part task trainers and the aeroplane. It's all put in together. Now, what we had initially is to, for the crews to help uh, train themselves before they get on the aeroplane, or the simulator, I should say, is a MFTD, as it was called initially. It was a maintenance flight training device because not only for, for aircraft and crews, it was used for maintenance training. And this was a flat screen, much cheaper, of course, but it, the air, it could be flown through the autopilot. And the whole idea, of course, is that you, you train by learning by doing, and you can, it was a very effective means of training before you get on the flight simulator. The important thing nowadays, as I say, is the crews are working together rather than just flying the aeroplane. And this is a very effective part on the initial uh, MFTDs. 
The important thing, as I say, it has the identical software to the simulator. There's an A380 MFTD, and here's an example of a crew working together. Okay, uh, engine one, fire. This is a crew on an A320 as part of their conversion training. See, it's an engine fire. And you can see that they're working together. The first officer in the right-hand seat is actually flying the airplane, if I can put it that way, through the autopilot controls. And as you will see, they've been working together. The important thing is for the, any changes to the aeroplane must be cross-checked by the crews, such as pressing fire bottles. We can see in due course that um, one crew will call for the action and the other one will confirm that the action is correct. And you see he's confirming push. that he's doing the right thing. Now we're coming to the sales pitch on the flight simulation group. As I said before, that there were no standards. The flight simulation group was formed in the 1970s. Interestingly enough, Wolfgang, Wolf Dieter, sorry, Haas, was Lufthansa flight training chief and he was a long-term member of the flight simulation group and he was the chairman in 2004 to 2006. They produced the initial standard for, for the top level full flight simulators and then, which I'll confirm later, at 2005, Ed Cook, who was head of the FAA, said they wanted standards for all the training devices. So this international working group was, was set up under the flight simulation group, and that created a document which was accepted by KO and updated for upset recovery training. And it also, they produced another book for helicopters. As I say, that was Ed Cook of the FAA who requested that be set up. So the first thing they did, of course, was to get the trading levels required and what sort of devices are necessary for them. And to say on the left, you can see that the very simple uh, low-level devices or low-level requirements, you, for instance, you can probably see there, you don't require motion up to level five. Um, you, you require low-level visuals but by the time you get to the level on the right-hand side, you've got level five, level six, and level seven, then everything must be correct. You must have the right cockpit, and you must have high-quality visual and motion, and the, as I say, the real flight deck exactly like the aircraft. As I say, it was as a result of this work, the Royal Aeronautical Society has been, or has been granted observer station, status in ICAO. That means to say we can have an input into ICAO as an observer, which very, very few organizations, if any, have a, a, simil a similar right to do. One should talk about uh, safety as a result of the training. And you can see there how much, how s safe things have got. The interesting thing is you see the First green line is the early jets of 707s. That's the safety is getting worse, in fact, because of course it goes off to the third world uh, airlines. The second generation was the likes of the 747, um, with, uh, but they had th two, uh, three pilots, two pilots and a flight engineer. And you can see there that the line doesn't start off the clock. It goes up and then down. So I think probably having three crew on the, on the flight deck helped the introduction of that generation of airplanes. But you can see the third generation, which was the 
the 757767. Again, the accident rate was high to begin with and then drops off quite rapidly. And then again, when the fly-by-wire, the A320 generation of airplanes came in, that started, you can see, with, a, with off the clock to begin with, but now it's got the safest of all the lot. So it, it, what that does show, of course, is that uh, when you bring in a new system, you can expect there to be a slight change in the safety level for a while. So if people start talking about reducing the number of pilots, they ought to be, think very carefully, because when you bring in something new, you can expect a slight hiccup in the safety aspects. But this shows how safe we have become. A lot of that, of course, is a result of simulator training and the devices. Now, what um, came up in 2009 is that loss of control in flight started to become the, the highest cause of most fatalities. Still the same number of accidents, in fact, as controlled flight into terrain, which had been the highest accident cause for some time. But in fact, because it's done mostly at high level, the, high, high, the fatalities were the highest. And the two most significant ones, perhaps recently, was the Kogan went to Buffalo in 2009, and then, of course, Air France 447. Getting back to the flight simulation group, in 2009, ICATI was created, International Committee for Aviation Training and Extended Envelopes. That was set up again under the flight simulation group, and it sat for four years, as all of us in Montreal in halfway through in 2011. And as a result of the recommendations and the work done by ICATI, the Royal Aeronautical Society gave ICATI its um, Specialist Team Bronze Award in 2006, 2014, sorry. And that again shows more work of the Flight Simulation Group, which was appreciated by ICAO, because the work of, Ica of ICATI was adopted eventually by ICAO. Now we come to the Airbus engineering side. Uh, that's the, the simulation side of Airbus. And just to emphasize the time scale, the engineering simulators create an iron bird. You can see that the design starts five years before the aircraft goes into service. Then it's developed uh, the systems, and the systems are integrated. And then there's a first flight, of course. But the actual Iron Bird itself will, will run, expected to run for at least 25 to 35 years to support the aircraft. Different to Boeing, actually. Boeing get, get rid of their Iron Birds after the aircraft goes into service. We run down this V type, which shows. On the top left, there were demonstrators, research simulators. It goes down to the bottom of the V when the systems are sent out to, to the subcontractors and then up to the right how they work together. And if we just summarize that, the initial concepts are up on the left-hand side. That's five years, as I say, before the aircraft goes into service. The, they're developed, of course, in-house, the software. That's put in one of the cockpit uh, simulators with the pilots involved. Then all the systems are defined. They're sent out to the subcontractors. Because, of course, Airbus, they, they actually develop their own flight control software. But most of it is sent out to the likes of Honeywell. And then when that's finished, that goes back to Airbus and has to be integrated. Once it's integrated, it's fed into the aircraft zero. That's the simulator which is most like the aircraft or identical to the aircraft. Once the aircraft is flown, you get feedback into that simulator. And then you eventually end up with your training simulator software, again, which is identical to what's on the aircraft. That's a, a, a room where, in fact, all the integration software is, is put together. 
But an important uh, aspect of the flight engineering simulators is actually making sure that any errors are detected as early as possible. You can see on the left, you've got 2.5x. That's as the systems are being developed. If you pick up the errors, the errors then, the figure is it's 2.5. However, as you go down to the integration at the bottom, it becomes 6.5. If the error is not picked up on the top right-hand side until the aircraft's in service, of course, it's 110x, so it's vastly more expensive because you've got to start redesigning the system and modifying the airplanes. So that's a very important part of the engineering development system. So there's the Airbus Iron Bird. Um, the sim the, it has a visual system. It's very expensive, of course, so they just have one uh, visual system which floats up and down in front of the cabs. You can see these on the next side. These are the, the cabs they have, one for development, and one will be the 350, was the 380, and as I say, they're using them for at the various stages of development of the aircraft. And what those cabs are doing is driving the Iron Bird, the hydraulic systems, which are identical to what is on the aircraft. Um, and as, you, as the controls are operated, so the undercarriage will work, and the flight controls will work, and the engines will run. So that's, as I say, done on the development side, and it's also kept running when the aeroplane is in service. So we then come to the actual aircraft itself. Some of the, most of the tests that we've seen can be done on the simulator, but not all of them. And this is one example is the uh, unstick VMU, minimum unstick speed, which you may have seen. This certainly can't be done on the simulator. So this is done on the aircraft. So you can see what that was, is to deliberately rotating to a tail skid to establish the minimum speed that the aircraft can unstick on the runway. If you go back to the time of the Comet 1s, they over-rotated, they had a couple of accidents where the aircraft actually over-rotated and went straight on. So flying test bed, suggested as a form of simulation, all the... Mathematicians will love CFD stuff, won't you? Um, but also you might say this is a form of simulation. These are checked in the wind tunnel. Space tourism, well, you can see there, there's, you cannot have motion system for that, getting back to it. So they have a simulator which is um, without motion. A little bit of personal stuff there. I see that Dave Mackay is the chief test pilot for Virgin Atlantic. He also flies with Virgin on the A340, or he did. And it so happened he gave a lecture to us and met up with his old mate, uh, Peter Chandler, who at the time was the chief test pilot of Airbus. And I see that um, Dave Mackay was on one of the glider flights of the latest Virgin Galactic test. So they have a simulator without motion, of course, but they can use their... Um, launch Spaceship 2 for steep approaches. For if you're going on a space flight, I think they are requiring you that you get into one of these um, high-G simulators, which you can find at Navstar, uh, to make sure that you don't get surprised when you have the 4G acceleration you're bound to get on your space travels. Um, just a summary of the training progression. I think we showed that. We start at park task trainers. We're going up to full, uh, full flight simulators. I haven't talked about the military, because that's another subject, but that's a full mission sim tra training environment in the military, because they network together. You can 
simulate both your, your friend and your foe and the difference between civil and military training, of course you're doing a lot of close contact stuff so you can simulate in flight, refueling, formation flying, etc. So I think we can whip through this very quickly just to emphasize the initial training for pilots on light aircraft and on more sophisticated airplanes when they come to the first aircraft type rating on the A320 they're going to end up on the full flight simulator but unless you Done 1,500 hours, I think the figure is at the present moment is that the, air, the pilots must fly the airplane, so you still have to do base training on the airplane. But when you transition to the next generation of airplanes, if you're already qualified, then you don't have to do any base training. But the important thing to mention, every six months perhaps, it depends on the company, you must come in for two days of training on the simulator every six months. And if you do not do your, so your recurrent training, then you should not operate. And so the important thing is to, to emphasize how much the airlines rely on flight simulation. You can see that the cost of simulators actually is reducing due to the film's gaming industry and the cost that's commercial off-self items. Initially, the simulator manufacturers used to build their own simulators no more they just use standard simulators now but you can see all the various fairly obvious advantages in flight simulation and uh, the improved training the cost you're not taking up air traffic control time you're not taking up slots and finally of course i will say there is the upset recovery prevention training you could do at high level and low level which you couldn't possibly do on the airplane. And finally, of course, that you're not using airplanes and for, for damage to the environment, uh, as I said before, for ATC slots. And avoiding training accidents, a slight hobby horse. Uh, training flights were higher risk, but uh, in the company I was with, we had no training accidents. But the important thing to remember, for airlines, lose their simulators, then their operational stop, stop very quickly. So, are you reassured that we're trading to the right standard? Is there any need for, uh, for real training? Because all we say is all automatic. If we have time, here are a few little videos going back some time, but it illustrates what can go wrong. That's, a, I think, a bit of a spoof, perhaps. This one is a hard landing done deliberately in testing. And I, I know uh, to a mel Melody, who is the very nice man, who actually was the chief test pilot of McDonnell Douglas, so he, he knew all about that when the airplane was put together and flew again. Um, uh, this is a, that was done deliberately on a flight test. Do you remember this one? Very publicly one at Farnborough. Not a very good quality video, but uh, this actually happened at Farnborough. Shows that you need to practice your short landing technique fairly well. Fortunately, nobody was hurt there, of course, but rather embarrassing to say the least. So, what? Do you remember that? One of my friends went back to his car after that. Oh, really? Yes, oh, yeah. Well, actually, I was at Farnborough when John Derry felt his airplane fell to bits. Um, this is, a, if we've got time, this is helicopter training. That's another story. Uh, helicopter simulation is, is progressing, but, of course, for small operators, the cost of the simulator is probably more than the cost of the helicopter. So there is a temptation just to get in your helicopter and fly it. But here is the effect.
the game, he gets out of it all right, so it's, there's nothing to be concerned about. But the bottom line, he just bought his helicopter and thought uh, he'd go and fly. He's just learning how to fly this helicopter, he hasn't had any time in it, he just bought it and he owns the helicopter and he just ate the big one. He was told not to try to fly the thing, I believe. And Has he been checked out in that car? No, I don't think so, not at all. So that, again, emphasizes the need for uh, training in helicopters. Talking about landing in strong crosswinds, um, you may have seen this one. This was in Hamburg. It was a very strong crosswind on runway 24, I think it was. But uh, as you got to the runway threshold, there was to be a big gust because the wind would, would come clear of the, of the trees. So you can see that approaching with a certain amount of drift. That's when it hit the dust from the right. But the good thing was they went around. When in doubt, go around. But the whole business of crosswind landings it is quite interesting in that um, the there's no limit on the manual crosswind. There's one which is demonstrated. And so what the people in flight tests on all aircraft, on the manufacturer's aircraft have to do is to find a strong crosswind, land in it, and that becomes a maximum de demonstrated crosswind. I was reminded the other day at Toulouse, the first A300 aircraft, the first Airbus that they ever built on the first flight, it took off and, in a, and the crosswind was significant. And apparently the very first landing of the A300 it was the maximum demonstrated crosswind they ever had. I'm not normally in excess of about 40 knots, I guess. So anyhow, this is a uh, video, as you may have seen, of the A340 up at Airbus A You've probably seen there are many, many of these on the web. A lot of them on head on landing in various airfields and crosswinds. But I include that really to show that the manual, there's no manual limit. There's a max demonstrated crosswind, and obviously. You would be foolish if you actually landed in excess of it. However, there is an auto land limit, and therefore the auto land can only land in a crosswind up to a certain amount. Beyond that, the crews have to land it manually. So you still need pilots to fly the aeroplane at the present moment in strong crosswinds, because at the present moment, the auto land cannot cope in very strong crosswinds. So we come back to this, do we really need to have pilots? Is there any real need for simulator training? Well, I would say that if you're talking about going into the simulation industry, the, regardless of we need pilot training, you're going to need engineering simulators. They're the central part of the design and manufacture and develop of the aircraft, whether or not they lead to crew training simulators, which I think will be around for a little while. Um, I personally, this is uh, from Airbus, my friends at Airbus, they, they, they're thinking on the simulation side, will they ever have, be able to create a real-time virtual aircraft? Be a little time yet, and I would say perhaps we'll get rid of pilots when they can actually uh, develop or create a real-time virtual aircraft, which includes everything that's in the aeroplane. I think a little time to go yet. So, final summary, my sales pitch for the Royal Aeronautical Society Flight Simulation Group that the Royal Aerosoc has been granted observer status at ICAO due to the work of the Flight Simulation Group and we're about the only organisation that has this privilege. People like Boeing can't input straight into um, ICAO. They have to go through their state where we have an access straight to ICAO. And to emphasise, Flight Simulation Group members are willing to describe this to the branches. So final recommendation, which I think you might have seen before, is always fly first class. <laughs>
I don't know if you've seen it. From across the globe, from the centre of aerospace, and now to you. Thank you for downloading from the Royal Aeronautical Society. If you enjoyed this content, please consider showing your support for the Society. Share a link to this presentation by email or on your favourite social networks. If you have an interest in aerospace, consider the professional and personal benefits of membership. Visit www.aerosociety.com.